access and for free is because of the government of Canada during COVID has given additional funds to CEO to put on all of these types of learning circles and allowed us to invite everybody in our network all over the world, which all um, is really amazing. It's not just for Canada. This is also why you have to answer a ridiculous amount of questions. It's not because of us. It's because of funding. You have to hate the structure. Um, but we wanted to provide something like this uh, for free for everybody. Um, I really want to, at CEO, we are a radical generous community of women that are funding women that are working on the world's to-do list. And when we're transforming systems, we really actually have to transform ourselves first. And through COVID and racial reckoning and things that have happened, we have had the racial justice working group that's been led by one of our ventures, Wakumi um, Soul Sisters in the US. And we've had over 90 activators and people in our community a part of that. We've done Rooted in Our Story, in your story, with Echo Alec, who is our Indigenous leader in our education piece. And through all of this, we talk about our invisible and our visible. And instead of just introducing who you are and your business, um, we really want to talk about what's visible and invisible of us uh, as ourselves. And I went through Rooted in, the, in Your Story and in the, in the, in what we were taught was around protocol. And I just actually want to share with you what my protocol is, um, talking about the visible and invisible to kick off tonight before we just go into a quick breakout session uh, for everybody to kind of get to know each other before we dive in. So I'm Hannah Cree. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a white cisgender woman. I'm learning how to decolonize myself every day. Um, I was born in and from three generations of my family is in the Salish territory in Vancouver, BC. And I just moved back to Calgary last night. The only thing that's set up in my house is literally my computer. And, um, and so I am situated in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. It's situated on Turtle Island on Treaty 7 land. <sighs> I really... Um, I'm, my role is really to listen and synthesize and amplify to bring uh, information and storytelling to the world. And I stand for humanity and equity. And I'm going to use my sacred rage to transform my and the world's pain into uh, beauty and connection. And so that is my protocol that I wanted to share with you today. And I know that Suzanne's also been through the Racial Justice Working Group and Rooted in a Story. She is one of our fellow ventures of Isle. Florence from Chia Sisters is here. And what we want to do today is share with you what building impact into your model really looks like. You know, there's lots of different words, social entrepreneurs, impact, doing good. And at, here at CEO, we actually base it out of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And that's what we call the world's to-do list. And so that's what we're going to share with you. But how we're going to do it is we're going to give different examples from all the different ventures because we all have different models and different ways that we do it. And our hope today is that we inspire you to figure out how you can put more impact deeply embedded in your model so that when all chips are down and something like COVID happens, does your impact go away or not? Is that the first thing that goes out of your model because you can't do it? Or is it deeply embedded and this is why you live and breathe what you do? And those are really some of the big differences for the ventures here. So now that we've kind of gone over the high level and I can't wait to uh, kick off, what we want to do is just quickly put you into um, breakout groups. And what I want you to do in the breakout groups, these are women from all over the world. Please feel free to introduce yourself in any way that you feel you want to share. If that's the visible or invisible about you, um, you are going to have one minute each. You do not have to take up the whole one minute. You could take up five seconds. Come as you are, be on your own terms, be in this space together, and then quickly share maybe what's one thing that you really want to take away. And when you come back, I, we want to hear in chat how you're going to take what, what you want to learn today so that we make sure that we also cover that. So I have about, there's going to be about three to four people in each room. You're going to have a total of five minutes and I will uh, message you and stuff in chat and then bring you back. 
And then uh, Suzanne and Florence, if you want to, if you want to go into the group, go ahead. Or if you want to stay back, all your choice. I'll chat with you then. Perfect. Here you go. Oh, there's some, some stragglers. That means they had really good conversation. There you are. Welcome back, everyone. We really appreciate it. We're excited to dive in um, into that. I want you to encourage you to use chat. You can ask us questions. We may call on you and ask you to come off mute, mute to ask that question. But if it's in chat, I can do a, a really good job at tracking it. So you know that um, I'm just going to do an overview, provide a little bit of an example from my own adventure. And then Suzanne's going to talk about her venture, how they, how they track their impact, how they do their impact. And then there's always questions at the end of Suzanne's piece, of Florence's piece, and then some group um, discussion that we can have. So please use chat. If there's anything um, in terms of the otter piece, let me make sure, thanks for letting me know. If you click on it, nothing's coming up. If we can get someone, it looks like it might be coming up on mine. Um, I will just make sure that there's an otter link. I'll see if I can share that with you in one second. I'll make sure that that's coming up. I'm just getting the access to it. So I'm going to just jump in. Um, the otter one should reload. I've just pressed that reload button. So let's jump in around what is impact, what's social impact, what's the world's to-do list. Um, yes, you'll absolutely get to see the people in, in the rooms again. So when you hear that a company has impact, what do you think of or look for? What are you looking for as a consumer or as an investor or as another venture? Tell me in chat right now, what does the word impact or social impact mean to you? Transparency, what a great word. Yeah, I love that word. That's a great one. What are some other words that you're thinking about when integrity? Are there certain things that you're looking for in a company that they should be doing? to have social impact. So we have some really great words here like collective, community involvement, collaboration, growing together, accountability, affecting change, more than just a profit motive, changing status quo, environmentally friendly. Um, wow, vulnerability, improving people's lives, people first, quadruple bottom line. I love that one, quadruple. Okay, so those are all really good. That kind of bases, that's the baseline. And so every venture at CEO who is funded is working on what we call the sustainable development goals. That's from the United Nations. So you're going to hear SDG a lot through this. And um, what we're doing is we're doing something to, towards creating a better world with our business model, whether it's through our ethical supply chain, whether it's people paying people a living wage, or maybe it's the environment. Um, but what I want to be really clear on with the SDGs with the United Nations is that this was actually created for governments. That whole thing is created for governments. And so you need to be able to look at it through your own business or nonprofit lens and look at what you can use. And it has 169 uh, targets with 230 indicators. And so that's a lot. But that also means there's so many different ways that you can have impact on the world with your model. It doesn't have to be so narrow. There's so many different ways that you can do that. And so my first advice would be start where you are with what you have. A lot of people try to create all the impact in the world with their model before they've even made any revenue. You need money for a mission. So really you have to be able, this is, there's no such thing as balance <laughs> when you're dealing in this world, but those are the things that you're always going to be juggling with. Um, so what is, this is the question when you're looking at your own model, what key impact do you want to have on the world with your company? Just what, what's one key impact? What is it? And how do we measure this? So, you know, Tiger Box, one of our ventures, she knows how many number of trees saved with her model. 
with my own, with Common Good, we employed people that were facing incredible trauma caused by homelessness. We could track the hours of a living wage very easily of what we're doing. So how do we measure that? Now that's very much an output like those number based things are just outputs. And then we have big outcomes and outcomes could be the SDG, like no poverty or climate action. And those are the big things that we need so many thousands of different organizations to do to create no poverty. My venture on its own cannot create no poverty. I need so many other people to do that with me. And so really looking at outcomes versus outputs, um, and then some challenges that you're going to have is how do you actually measure maybe the social, emotional, education kind of impact that 21 toys or grow your mind, some of our ventures do when they're, when we start to deal in the emotional piece, that's a really harder thing to track. How do we quantitate? How, how do we take that uh, information? So we're going to talk a lot today about uh, B certification, ethical supply chain, maybe your carbon footprint. We're going to give you lots of different tools. You might hear about 1% Planet, um, B Corp, all of that kind of stuff today. And so I'm going to give you kind of an example, a quick one for my own company with Common Good, is that at the beginning, we really, when we applied to, um, to CEO, we said our SDG was no poverty. I mean, we are employing people that are facing homelessness. We're paying a living wage. We're doing all of this. It's like, we're on no poverty. But how do we track that? How do I actually track no poverty? What does that look like? What's the data? What are my partners doing? And so we started talking to our nonprofit partners and it turns out they had a really hard time tracking that too. And they're like, yeah, we don't, we don't actually know how to track that. And so we started to look at what can we track within our own model. And it's, we could track our number of hours that we employed at a living wage. We have health benefits, health uh, saving matching plans, education, um, all of those types of pieces we could start to track. And when I looked at that, I was like, well, this isn't actually about no poverty for us. Um, what we were really doing on the SDG, the SDG we could report on was decent work and economic growth. Because that was what we were creating. And then we have an environmental piece to ours and we were using a biofuel machine that was re reducing 80% of our heating costs in this commercial laundry. And for us, I was like, oh, it's climate action. That's what we're doing. But really what it was, was responsible consumption and production because we could track that 80% that we were saving and all of those different pieces. So for today, when you're looking at your own pieces, I would really start to think about what can you track and what are you really working on towards and, and how can you really speak to that? Um, I also need to say that Brienne from NADA was supposed to be here today. She couldn't. Entrepreneur life, we all get it. And the beauty thing about this is Suzanne and I both know her well. I have a few notes and we've done this before. So um, I'm going to give a couple tips at the end from NADA. But I also know that Florence and Suzanne will cover most of this. And so she sends her regards for not being here. But we're all, uh, most of us are entrepreneurs on the call. We get that uh, things come up and uh, we're very supportive of, of moving there. So this is kind of, um, these are the perfect pieces here of where we wanted to start. And so now I'm going to hand it over to Suzanne and she's going to jump into how they built Isle. And I have to say that I'm originally from Vancouver and, and Suzanne and Madeline, I have watched well before CEO because they have pioneered and they have, that's not the right word, but they have been in the space forever. You have, you have blazed a lot of trails for a lot of us, especially women, but especially social entrepreneurs in this space. So thank you, Suzanne. And uh, I'll hand it over to you. Wow. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I feel a heavy weight of responsibility, but I'll do my best. So um, thanks, Hannah. And I just want to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to everyone here today from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. And that would include the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and um, Musqueam Nations. So yes, as uh, Hannah mentioned, Isle is proud to have been part of the CEO cohort. And when we were selected five years ago, we were actually known as the Lunapads. And for those of you who voted for us back then, um, thank you. And we rebranded actually in March March the 10th, 2020, the day that the WA show declared the global pandemic. So interesting timing on our part, but really the purpose of our rebrand was to establish the new period aisle and kind of 
stop talking about the feminine hygiene aisle. And our period aisle is the place where anyone of any size, gender expression, however they come to us, can find the most sustainable um, period products in the world. And so we make period underwear, cloth menstrual pads, and menstrual cups. Um, and so I'm gonna just jump into the slides uh, and I'm gonna share my screen. Um, hopefully it doesn't look too hectic because I do have a very crazy desktop. Um, here we go. Can we see? All right, so yes, yeah, so here we are and I'm just gonna take that part away. So that's what we make and uh, really love um, the new look and feel of, of Isle. Um, and maybe, before I get started in the exact measurements and impact things that we do, I wanted to just share my personal journey about what's happened in 2020 and how it's really affected me because obviously COVID and the fight for Black Lives Matter and Indigenous people's justice and rights, they're really at the forefront of my mind and should be hopefully of everyone else's mind. And as Hannah mentioned, I've been involved in the um, racial justice working group through the CEO activators and I've been doing some really deep personal learning and development and I want to thank Julia on this call for kind of flagging it and saying hey when we talk about impact like how are we thinking about justice and equity and reparations and so thank you Julia for applying that lens and so I've rethought about how I want to share um, our impact measures with you by applying that lens and so I think it's important to start when we think about impact as Hannah asked us to think about it is that when we look at the SDGs, and I want to also do a call out for Tira Fraser on the call, um, and when I think about SDGs, I think about SDG zero, and I'll let Tira talk about what that definition is because I won't do it justice. But the foundation of the SDGs is to reduce inequality and to leave no one behind. And the work that I've been doing with the Racial Justice Working Group, it talks about how inequalities are rooted in systemic racism and that those inequalities are actually obstacles to sustainable development. So as we talk about impact, I, I wanna challenge myself and others to think about how you can incorporate the SDGs and the impact that you're putting into your business and use it as a way to increase access to justice and support reparations. And I think you can't quite see all of it on my slide, but um, that's, that's the kind of lens I wanted to apply. Um, and so when you start thinking about your business and impact, like I think the traditional capitalist model just says like, look at it linearly and look at your resources and how you make it and, and what you consume and then the waste. And maybe a lot of businesses don't even think about waste. And, and rather to use a more holistic model that says, how are we making it? Um, what are we thinking about in terms of the design of it and who we're serving? And then when we use materials or any materials or services to um, create it, who are we servicing and who are we sourcing from? And how might we use materials that are better on the environment and better from an from a equity perspective? And then how are we thinking about the waste? So I just wanted to kind of reflect that, you know, in a very traditional impact way, we think about, okay, can we reduce the impact on the environment? And I think what's been really profound for me doing uh, the work with CEO is to just challenge myself in terms of thinking about impact in a much more, um, thinking about the racial justice lens and acknowledging, for example, that there's an extractive relationship that we have with the earth and the harm that it's causing and its impact on climate change. And to me, I think what really hit me hard when Wakumi has been talking to us is that how when we're extracting from the land that it actually parallels how indigenous dispossession has occurred and colonization has occurred and and that's a hard thing for me to acknowledge in here but it's a really good important reminder of how everything is impacted by what we are doing and, and the systemic kind of systems and structures and people and places that we are so accustomed to and, and we really should just challenge those things so that's that's the kind of um lens that I'm, I'm looking at things um, differently. And I attribute that to the great work that Shio has done with us. Okay, so just jumping into the SDGs then for Isle. Um, it's kind of obvious that because we make op options that are reusable for um, periods that uh, SDG 12 would be really important to us because um, we are diverting waste from landfills. 
And um, in fact, we have helped divert over 200 million pads and tampons from landfills since our inception back in the 90s. And we are diverting about 20 million uh, pads and tampons from landfills every year. And then how we make it, we choose sustainable textiles like Tencel, like organic cotton, and we use recycled materials like recycled polyester whenever we can and whenever we can source it. And then in terms of climate, like we uh, did a real big project this year to actually apply some information to our website so that customers could actually see the impact that they were having by making the switch. And I think what frustrates me is sometimes people go, oh, the small change that I'm making isn't going to have an impact. And so we felt it was important to provide that education and awareness to customers to show them that specific impact. And then realizing that kind of connection that we have to the land and that we need to be stewards of this land and apply that justice lens to trying to create a better environment for ourselves and, and serve people that, that really need that, need that extra um, equity and justice. And so with that, I mean, essentially the whole premise of when Luna Pads and Isle was founded was around gender equality and, and ensuring that people who have a uterus that experience a period, that it does create an, ex, an extra amount of burden on their life and that it shouldn't be a burden. It should be something that people can be able to have their full access to their life and be able to fully participate and be able to go to school every day. And there's millions and millions of girls and women, particularly in the global south, who don't have access to menstrual products and can't go to school every day or can't go to work every day. And so we do things to make sure that not only are we providing a product to the North American consumer or Western world consumer, but that we have programs that support those who don't have access. So we have made an investment in Afropads, which is based in Uganda. Um, and we also do a lot of pad donations to help girls stay in school. And um, so this is an example of just being beyond just looking at our bottom line, but looking at how we can support others um, in our community, whether it's locally in our community. And uh, tomorrow is Giving Tuesday and tomorrow um, we're announcing that we've donated uh, over $40,000 of underwear and pads to folks in BC housing because uh, we have excess inventory and we are donating it. And then globally, our relationship with Afropads. And the really interesting thing that I learned is that when you are helping girls and women to become stewards of the environment, that they actually can help support climate change. So there's so many different intersections of how what we do can really help in so many areas. So those are the high level um, SDGs that we're trying to impact. And when you are starting your journey on thinking about how you might associate impact with your business, um, I wanna just let you know that there are some tools out there that are readily available to everyone. You don't have to be a B Corp to access these tools. Um, there's a B Impact Assessment. And uh, there's also a new tool um, called the SDG Action Manager. So the impact assessment tool is kind of the light version of um, seeing whether or not you could become a B Corp. And it will look at things like your entire supply chain and how you pay your employees and the community that you serve. So it's sort of a light version of the B Corp um, certification. And then the SDG Action Manager tool was launched this January. And what it provides to anyone who goes on to it online is it helps you figure out a starting point for your impact and it looks at your operations and then it gives you some structure to set some goals and to track your um, improvement. So these are some things that may be useful to you. They can get a little bit um, intense. And uh, speaking of intense, like there is a data collection process. If you want to have an impact, um, being able to measure it is really the best way to prove that you're having an impact and communicate it to others of what you're doing. So this is an example of the work that we did this year to um, apply that climate lens to our products. We looked at our supply chain, we measured, you know, what was the distance from the factory to our warehouse and then similarly the average distance from our warehouse to the customer took a very close look at every single material that went into the production of our products. And then we start counting like how much waste have we created and uh, we put it through a calculator and um, it's able to actually tell us the exact impact. So the tools that we use to measure um, include 
the B Corp certification process and we get certified um, every three or four years. We get audited and go through a fairly rigorous process. Um, there is also a tool called Climate Smart. And again, it's an online tool where you put in the inputs of like your business and what you do and how much waste you create. And it actually kind of turns out like the actual greenhouse gas carbon emissions of operating your business. And then finally, um, this summer we engaged a, a company called Green Story and um, they went through that process that I described earlier with us here. And what it produced as an output is something we're super proud of and it's super cool. Um, on our homepage, it actually calculates the cumulative effect of everyone who has purchased our product since the brand relaunch in March and summarizes the cumulative impact. And then on the product page, you can actually see each product, the um, say in this example, the amount of disposables that have been replaced because you've used um, an aisle pad the emissions that have been avoided, the amount of energy that's been saved, and uh, it shows up on the product page on your desktop or on your, um, on your smartphone. And the reason we do this too is because we want to empower the customer to know that they're having a tangible impact and we wanna educate them and say that you are doing something good in not just choosing our products, but you're doing something for the environment. So it's part of education and it's part of storytelling. Um, I will just add also that having certifications can be really useful. It can um, help you measure your impact, but it also, it inspires customer confidence. It's sort of like having a fair trade certification. It's, it's telling people that you've gone that extra step to choose inputs that have a, a much more favorable impact on the environment and um, that you've taken the care to be transparent and as aisle, like there's a lot of folks in our space. There's a lot of folks who are doing period underwear and we do this because we are a values based business and we do this because we're a B Corp. And we also do this to differentiate ourselves and say that this is what we stand for. And we're trying to attract the customers that that care about these things. And then finally, um, just report on your impact. And uh, so we're just trying to get better at reporting. Um, having the tool on our website is the first step. Um, we on and off have been reporting and providing reports to our shareholders, but this year we want to do a much more public report about um, what the impact is of our products and over time and just include that in some reporting so that people can see and, and feel a tangible impact and, and then we're not just greenwashing, which can happen. Um, and then we also want to report on our social impact because um, we do have shareholders, investors, and customers who really do care about these things. And we tend to be a little kind of humble and, and don't kind of toot our horn, but it's really important to um, not do this to toot our horn, but actually set an example, raise the bar and inspire others to do more. So um, in summary, I, I just want to share that the way to start creating impact is figuring out what you're good at and what things matter to you, set goals, go through the effort of collecting that data and finding tools to make it easier and begin measuring it and then, and then share it and make, um, make others feel inspired by your work and um, remember that you're doing good work and remember that your work has an impact, not just on the environment, but on your community and that your impact can actually have ways to create greater social justice and and even start working towards reparations and that's really my big learning for 2020 because i've been measuring impact for a long time as um hannah very kindly um shared and that 2020 has really been a, a real awakening for me in terms of going deeper so i'm done my presentation and really um wanted to invite folks to ask questions there's, uh, that was so incredible, Suzanne, really. I, again, learned more from you on, on that. And I have to say the chat was just like, how inspiring, how inspiring, really amazing work. Um, so incredibly helpful. Like, oh my gosh, so many good. So a couple of questions. So one is from Dana, which uh, was just confirming Green Story focused primarily on the textile industry. Yes or no? No, it's focused on any service but uh, or product, um, and, and they have a team of 
technicians that just look at your entire business and its supply chain and can share out that story. Um, I don't know a lot of their other clients. I know their, I've, I personally have focused on their um, apparel clients because that's the business that we're in, but I'm yeah. quite certain that they, they look at other clients and would invite you to check them out. Oh, that's great. And then it says, what was the other measuring tool? It was on the page between uh, B Corp and Green Story. I think that was Climate Smart. Yes, it was. Yes. Okay. And uh, they started as a Vancouver based business and they've expanded across Canada and they were recently acquired and I don't know the exact name, but uh, by a bigger company. So they're, they're growing and they're going to have um, a bigger footprint on helping businesses measure their um, greenhouse gas emissions and climate impact. Oh, wow. I didn't even know they were from Vancouver. That's really cool. Um, another question from Diane, how did you select your suppliers? I think this is a great one. Yeah, well, it's, it's an iterative process. Like when we first started, we started local and we just picked who was, you know, in our community. And as we have evolved, we have criteria and we look first and foremost of whether or not they have the certifications that we're looking for around being Okio Tech certified, um, that they are GRS certified. Like there's a number of things that we have in our toolkit to say, you have to pass this minimum level of um, certification for us to even acquire your textiles and raw materials. And so we have a team that goes out and, and looks for those companies and then we then get samples and evaluate it. And there's so many things that go into it. Like, is it, is it good for the environment, but then does it work? Does it wick? Does it absorb? Is it leak proof? So there's a number of different factors that go into picking our suppliers. And then on the production side, obviously choosing a manufacturer that is ethical and has, you know, fair trade practices and, we inspect them and make sure that they're um, meeting our standards. Mm, yeah, that's great. Um, do you know, this is from Dana, do you know what your impact is with respect to the market, re reusable disposable pads? Dana, do you want to just go off mute and just tell yeah. me that question? Let's see if I can. Yeah. Yes, yes, Suzanne, it's Dana, and, and I was just curious as to, you know, you're doing some incredible work, and thank you so much for the presentation. It's, I know that we think sometimes that this stuff is just a drop in the bucket, but, but for the entire market of, of pads, you, and you said that there are a lot of other people kind of in the market doing what you do, where is that taking over from traditional disposable pads and where do you stand as, as that piece of the market in its entirety? Do you know that or can you even collect that data? Um, you know, I'm starting to gather that and I do it because actually I'm in the middle of a, a equity raise for our company to grow and, and um, source some new sources of capital so that we can continue growing. And investors are curious about that because do they want to invest in a company that um, is only just scratching the surface and is there room for improvement? And what we've gathered in terms of data is that um, the reusable market is definitely starting to take away from the disposables market. And a report that we got a hold of said that there are already 5 million customers that have switched um, away from disposables and that the market for reusables has exceeded a billion dollars. So I can see it in terms of dollars and number of customers. In terms of climate impact, I guess I would infer the data that we have from um, Green Story and say, well, for every reusable pad, we're saving 150 disposables. And for every pair of underwear, we're saving 150 disposables. And so you could kind of do the math. Um, and in terms of climate impact, like, you know, we've got that calculator on our website. So one could try and infer it with the industry as a whole. And, and maybe do a bit of that math, but it is moving and um, it's why so many people are starting to become attracted to reusables in the same way that people didn't used to carry their own water bottles and they never used to carry reusable shopping bags to the store. And so this is becoming um, an area where people feel empowered to make a difference and know that they're making a difference. And then to, to layer on top of that, this is a bit of a sales pitch, but you actually feel better when you make the switch. And I'm gonna let other folks who maybe have made the switch to chime in and say that, but there is a psychological difference of 
taking kind of ownership of your body and not kind of feeling like it's shameful and disposable and wasteful and just having a whole new attitude about, about how you feel about your choices. Hmm. This is so good. So good. Do you begin, uh, did you begin measuring, measuring from the start? And if not, when did you start measuring impact? I know this is a big question for most entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I see them trying to measure every, or like, do, like I'm going to cure the world <laughs> to like not do anything at all. Cause it's overwhelming. So what was that uh, journey for you? Like for sure, we didn't measure from the start because when you're an entrepreneur, you're just trying to figure out your business model and where you're going to get the next customer and where you're going to get money. And so this is an evolution of, no kidding, 20 years of work. And, um, you know, we only started launching that life cycle analysis calculator on our website literally this fall in September. So it's a lot of kind of learning and figuring out what tools you want to use, but also like what what matters to you the most and what and that actually has evolved for for us because for us in the early days it was just impact around women and periods and then we said okay we need to evolve that and it needs to be about helping folks in the global south and then it evolved into wait a minute we need to think about gender and and language and the gender spectrum and then it's like, okay, size, we need to evolve around the size and, and not just size inclusion, but like actually making products that really truly fit. And there was an article in Allure this week that said like, you guys really care about how products are designed and fit. And then, and, and then we, we did the life cycle analysis. So I think you said it earlier, Hannah, baby steps and, mm -hmm. and feel good about the choices and do things that matter to you first and then start adding on things as you grow and as you learn and as you have the capital and funding to be able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Suzanne, you're amazing. You're obviously, we're going to keep, we're going to keep going. Um, and thank you for leading and also just and doing the work, showing up and doing the work and, and acknowledging that we always have more to learn, right? It's like, 10 years ago, it's like, oh, it's B Corp. And now it's, you know, how do we deconstruct our systems and do anti-racism work in impact, social impact? I didn't even see that 10 years ago, right? And, and so you've really like um, been very vulnerable, shown up, done the work and know that, you know, we always have more work to do. So thank you for that. The tools, everyone, do not worry. We will send out the direct links to everything that's mentioned. Um, we also have a blog already started being created with all these links because we really feel, for me, um, I, I said this about five years ago, I said, you know, in five, 10 years, we shouldn't have a word for social enterprise. This is just the way we do business. This is how we build our models because we are in a time that like we cannot be extracting from the earth over and over and over again. And uh, COVID has shown that, that we have to do this faster. And these are the businesses, not of the future. This is how we do business now. So thank you for leading that piece. And now I want to hand it over to Florence, another CEO venture across the world from me, Chia Sisters. So why don't you jump into uh, your presentation and the tools and how you've been building, um, building Building this. Perfect. Kia ora. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Heidi Takamua Takamudi Kauifai Tinako to Katoa, Ko Fangamoa Timonga, Ko Mahitahi Te Awa, Ko Aurere Timuana, Tinatamahi Mahana Kiakoto, Tinakoto, Tinakoto, Tinakoto Kato. Kia ora everyone, my name is Florence, really excited to be here today and so impressed with um, the turnout and the enthusiasm. I think as you were saying, Hannah, this is something that, um, you know, used to seem very forward thinking and now it really is just the norm, which is certainly reflected in um, the number of people here today. So... I am the co-founder of Chia Sisters. We make four ranges of health drinks that you can see on my screen. Um, and I think, again, as, as you were saying, Hannah, we're not, um, you know, class is a, a charity. Some people call us a social enterprise, but we really do believe that um, businesses are responsible for the massive amount of inequality in the world today and um, the environmental destruction that's going on and that just can't continue. 
So we really want to be doing business in a way that has a positive impact on the planet and people. And we make all business decisions now with that in mind. And we don't see ourselves as doing anything special. Um, we're certainly on a journey. We've got a long way to go. But um, we like to start thinking that this is, this is the normal way of doing business now. So I thought um, I would just go through the four um, or five SDGs that our business focuses on and our, uh, the way we've got to those SDGs has certainly been a, a journey. So you'll see um, as I talk through them how they've developed over time. And I think as um, you know, Suzanne has already said, baby steps are great. You know, you can't tackle all the all the world's problems all at once. And that's certainly something that we have um, realized over time. It's, you know, our company has grown and with its growth, we've had more opportunities to make positive change. And, you know, a lot of people ask, oh, is it really difficult to, to hold on to your values as you grow? But we certainly think the opposite is true of us and um, can be true of any, everyone that as you grow, you've got more business decisions to make, and that means you've got more opportunity to do good and, and bring um, values that will have a positive impact on our planet and our people into your decision making. So I found that a, a really exciting part of our growth story to date. So just as a bit of background, um, we started this company eight years ago, and we uh, basically realized that there was no energy drinks that were actually healthy on the market in New Zealand. So there were many that, you know, said that they were no added sugar or no caffeine, but actually most of them weren't that good for you and they didn't have the, the added nutrition of a functional beverage. So we launched um, our chia drinks on the market in New Zealand um, in 2013 and they are Australasia's most nutritious bottled beverage and the opportunity there was really to um, replace or to create an option, an on-the-go option for people that were wanting to enjoy a healthy snack that didn't have the artificial ingredients, it didn't have the added sugar and it actually had um, lots of fibre, iron, magnesium, lots of actual nutrients in there to um, keep us going for longer and in a, in a healthy way. And so the way we started naturally fit with um, the SDG3, good health and well-being, and that was the basis um, of our company to start with. And then was actually a really interesting time um, in 2018 we um our company had a bit of strife so things were going really well our chair drinks were being sold in supermarkets across new zealand and australia and we were having those drinks made for us by um a factory this factory in, in the photo here and then suddenly um that factory which was a brewery went into liquidation at very short notice and so suddenly we had um a decision to make. Do we move into this factory that's made for a company 20 times our size or do we close down our business? And it was a very, um, you know, a real decision at the time. We called around all these other bottling plants across New Zealand and no one had the capacity to make our drinks, particularly um, because they have quite a unique texture uh, at such short notice. So we decided to move into the factory and we decided this would be a real opportunity to do business and, and do good at the same time and start living and breathing uh, some of the sustainability values that had always been um, really important to us. So we lined this brand new factory with solar panels and we became New Zealand's first solar powered juicery. We had um, 32 solar panels go up, so they have the ability to harness 16,000 watts of energy per hour. And that means we can send, uh, or our factory takes 8,000 watts per hour to run. So on a sunny day, uh, we're sending energy back to the grid and we can actually sell that energy back. So um, we're making money from it. And 
all up, we've sent about 3.5 million watts of energy back to the grid, and it's obviously a really um, renewable source. It's solar power has been named one of the best solutions um, to climate change in the world. So yeah, we're really super, super proud to have that going on. And it created a really cool opportunity for us as well, because we weren't at full capacity in this brand new factory. So we launched a new range uh, called Bottle by the Sun. And we called it Bottle by the Sun to celebrate our shift to solar power. This is a fresh pressed juice range made with local fruits um, within about 10 k's of that juicery. So this is a good example of how you can use these SDGs in, in your model um, to share a good story and um, make, you know, increase your company's growth at the same time. The next thing we did was that we hired all of the staff that had been previously working in that brewery on the factory line. They were all paid the minimum wage and we started paying the living wage. The living wage is a really awesome concept. I think it might be a New Zealand thing, so I will just uh, explain it. It's basically, it's 25% above the minimum wage and it's the amount that is worked out to be um, what a citizen needs to be an active participant in society. So not just to have the basics, but really to, to actively participate in community events and, and be a part of their community. And that's been a really fantastic shift for us. We've so far paid about $100,000 over, you know, what, what we would have paid if all of the people in our factory line were on the minimum wage. But to be honest, it's come back to us tenfold. We have super committed staff. Everyone loves being there. They have enough money to, you know, do things like take their family out to the movies in the evening and do things that they really enjoy. Um, so their happiness levels are up. And we have CVs coming in the door when we're hiring in the hundreds. So we can always choose, choose the best people. So... That is, um, you know, an SDG that we're really proud of, but has by no means been a significant economic or financial investment for us, which is certainly the opposite of, um, you know, what some people hear when they hear how much we're paying our staff. And I think also it's created quite a flat hierarchy um, at our business because my wage isn't too much less than, or too much more than the lowest paid staff member there is a really flat hierarchy and there's other benefits in that for example you know people feel more comfortable sharing their ideas and we have this um this really nice whanau which is maori for family at our work where we all feel comfortable sharing ideas and giving feedback which is all uh, a positive for our company so after we had this new factory up and running and all of our staff there these are them here. Uh, we have a few more now. We um, decided that we should measure our carbon emissions. And climate change is something that I have always been really, really passionate about. And I knew that businesses were the biggest um, emitters of carbon, but I realized that I actually had no idea how much carbon our business was emitting. And that was actually quite confronting for me to realize, you know, that this was something that I was very interested in, yet I never, um, you know, I could guess where our carbon emissions might be, but I never actually measured that. And I think this comes back to um, what both Suzanne and Hannah have been saying is, you know, measurement in your priority areas is really, really important because it enables you to share your story. And for us, it really enabled us to see where our sore points were as well. So you can see here, this is our carbon footprint. And by measuring our carbon emissions, we could identify the hot spots of where we could reduce our carbon emissions, which was really, really important. So after measuring, we aim to reduce as much as possible based on what you can see here. And we did that firstly by stopping air freight of all of our products and our products don't actually need to be air freighted they are ambient and they can um, go by sea overseas or by truck in New Zealand we actually found out quite interestingly that 10% of our tire 
carbon emissions for 2018, that was the first year that we measured, were for some samples, a pallet of samples that went to Japan for um, a deal that never went through and I barely could even remember it when we were measuring our carbon emissions. It had just been something that we said yes to because it seemed like a good opportunity and it never, um, it never came through. And that was 10% of our total carbon emissions. And I like to share this story because it shows how you can, once you've measured, you can see where the easiest ways are to make change. So the first thing that we did was we decided no more air freight for anything. We also um, changed our company cars to electric vehicles. We had the um, solar panels on as well, and we really tried to um, reduce our waste streams as much as possible. And so our total amount of CO2 or CO2 equivalents for our company is 56.3 tonnes, and we offset that by 120% by contributing to native planting and the upkeep of a native forest, which is just on our doorstep, um, about an hour from our juicery. This is it here. Uh, it's called the Ramika Forest. And it's also another really lovely way to share our story because people walk and bike through this lovely forest and by sharing photos of that with our customers, um, there's a really nice local story. So our fourth SDG, is that fourth or maybe that's fifth, um, is responsible consumption and production. And this is still very much a work in progress for us. I think the biggest sore point of our company right from the start is that we have a single serve product. And we've decided from the outset that we wouldn't bottle in plastic, plastic, um, Coca-Cola and Pepsi are two of the top three biggest emitters of plastic in the world. So bottling in glass was really important to us and we are also bottling in recycled glass. So that's glass that's been used by a New Zealander before and we're reusing that. So that's fantastic, but we've also gone one step further and we are really trying to shift our category towards returnable kegs. So they look like this, um, you can see on the screen, they are 20 liters and the way they work is we send them out to a supermarket or a cafe and they use them up um, by pouring them into glasses and then they get sent back to us. And this is something we were quite ambitious about last year. We thought that, you know, within two years we could really change the category and We've come to realise it's going to take a lot longer than that and you know we're sort of working on each customer one by one and it's going to be a long progress to really change that mindset shift for supermarket owners and cafe owners but our goal is to have 50% of our sales in kegs by 2025 and really be um, advocates for shifting our industry towards this model so that we can we can get away from single serve. Two um, last little points that I wanted to share is firstly how important it is to share your story. I think um, there's so many fantastic stories of all your businesses but just choosing one SDG and sharing that um, has can have a few huge impact. Firstly it's you know, free marketing spend for you. Um, sustainability is very on trend right now, both with employees and also your consumers, um, the consumers of today and certainly the consumers of tomorrow. So I can't um, overestimate or I can't, yeah, emphasize enough how important it is to share your story. And as has been mentioned, just focus on one or two SDGs that you are very passionate about and can measure and share those with your customers. The second impact uh, or the second point that I wanted to make is how we can all help each other to solve these problems together. And I think business can be very, very competitive but it's really important that in the sustainability space, we all work together because there's some really common goals, um, particularly in climate change, for example, that if we all work together, we can all come up with solutions together and change the world together. And that's really what we need right now. 
So one thing that we have done is co-founded an organization called Businesses for Climate Change. And our goal is to have 1,000 businesses in our region to be zero carbon by the end of next year. And the way we're doing that is categorizing um, businesses together, for example, by sector or uh, emissions type. So for example, food and beverage all meet together, lawyers and accountants all meet together, fleet management, energy, and together they're creating solutions. So I'd recommend you look up our website and you can see um, some of the blogs and information starting to be shared on there is um, really, really cool. And the other resource that I have is a free um, carbon emissions tool um, if you go to ecos.co.nz i can put it in the chat thread and they've got um, a calculator where any business can go on and really easy easily figure out what their carbon emissions are and as i mentioned earlier most importantly figure out where um, the hot spots are so you can start reducing so i think that is all yeah that's the end of my presentation but i would um yeah love to have any questions that was so amazing. I love, um, there's so many different parts there from how you're treating your employees to what the packaging looks like. And now you're coming together as, you know, uh, as a collective saying, you know, we want to have a big goal of 1000, you know, zero carbon. And, and uh, it's amazing when you know, like-minded businesses and people come together, like you said, not, not just one business can do this, but it has to be a whole bunch of us coming together to actually make those pieces and to also put pressure on the bigger corporations out there. You know, I, I wrote a, I think I wrote a blog a, a little while ago, just saying, what if Amazon was actually a B Corp? Yeah. Like that will actually change economies and the structures of our cities and how people are paid and and our health system like like the bigger corporations and so but when the when all of us who are doing you know on different scales come together that pressure can be put on them because people then start to shop with us because we are looking at all of these other pieces right and so i think it's really really important okay so we have a question here diane is saying there are so many things in play to make and measure our impact yes um i love all the links you're providing to calculate but where would you get help setting these data collection and measure from the start and this is something we all kind of struggle with, right? It's like, where do we start? How do we do this? And I think, you know, one of our intentions was let's show all these different types of ventures, all of us, and we've done it in different ways. But like Suzanne said before, we start some at one place first and look at the core of your model, what your vision, like I say to people, look at your vision, what are you what's the one impact that you want to have and start there and then as you add like from my what i could see from your story it's like what is your packaging what's your ethical supply chain you just keep on acting for me i keep on asking and everything that we do in our business what's our impact and can we change that like good impact bad impact how about you what does that um, look like like how do you start with that data collection do you have specialized people on your team I wish we did, um, but we we don't. And I think, I mean, it's exactly what you've said. If you just choose one SDG, and for example, um, some of them are going to be easier than others. But when we started hiring um, all the factory line, paying them the living wage, it was really easy to see, okay, they're getting $7 an hour more. And it's, it's quite simple to calculate how many hours they're working and how many more dollars that is. And so starting in a, with a really simple sustainable development goal, I think is easier. Um, same with the solar panels. We put them on and we know, we can see from a little um, grid in our factory how much energy they're producing. And the investment for that was of course bigger, but it's so easy to measure now and it's having such an ongoing financial positive impact for us. So um, I'm not sure if that helps, but I think my advice would be start small, choose yeah. one thing and just um, think very carefully about how you can, can measure it in a simple way. Because I think another thing we get caught up with um, 
we've just become B Corp certified as well and doing all these different things you don't want to take away if you're a small business from the actual goal of what you're doing and actually having a positive impact by spending too long and getting too wound up and measuring. So it is really important, but try and do it as simply as possible. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there is lots of different organizations that can help you. I mean, I, I, I stressed entrepreneurs, like you still need money for a mission. So be careful when, like there is a point at which you should be going B Corp, but it doesn't have to be right off the bat. You know, if you don't have the money um, and the profit, because for me, like in our business, it was like, it was more important to us to pay a living wage, to have all these things in place for people that were facing poverty than to go after B Corp. Does that mean that we couldn't be B Corp certified? No, we took the impact assessment tool. We scored, we did all of that to ensure that we were doing what B Corp would require, but we weren't ready to pay for it yet because we still needed a little bit more profit. And so everything comes in steps. And I think those tools are really, really important. So I want to thank you, Florence, for providing that. And really, um, yeah, the calculator will also put that into um, all the tips and tools that you're going to get out afterwards. And I want to um, just address Tira Fraser, who is a CEO semifinalist and an activator um she's on here and there's an SDG that suzanne talked about alluded to that is not you're not going to see on the united nations website yet i think we might are all like starting to maybe go for this but it has come up in lift collective um, our indigenous sisters in canada and they are talking about sdg zero and um, this is something that's not appearing there, but it's something that's very important when we talk about impact, racial justice, anti-racism, decolonization work. So Tira, I'm wondering if you can come off mute and maybe just give us a couple minutes of what that is before we go into breakout groups. Mm, it would be my pleasure, Tanse. Hello, everyone. I'm Tira Fraser and I'm the um, founder of Esquail Air, which is an indigenous woman owned uh, airline in Canada, the first, and um, the bridge between traditional air transportation and the sustainable transportation of the future. And so in our uh, lift circle, which is all Indigenous women, when um, we were working on our venture applications and it, when it came to the SDGs, um, there were so many of my Indigenous sisters saying, as an Indigenous business, we're like, we're naturally doing all of these things. It's part, it's part of who we are as, as Indigenous peoples. It's, it's part of who we are as a, um, re in a relational worldview. Uh, it's how we view community. It's how we view, um, like, and so the Indigenous women are having a hard time actually are, are separating um how they were doing business from um the articulation of the sdgs because it's so naturally woven into the way indigenous peoples are um seeing and being and uh doing in the world so my um wonderful friend b uh, from the alinker um who was part of some of these uh conversations <clears throat> when I was preparing my venture application and others, she's like, you know what, actually, <clears throat> she said, where in these SDGs does it talk about um, Indigenous peoples, Indigenous sovereignty, and like, what, wh if we're talking about sustainable development goals, how come we're not, we're not talking about this? And so uh, we have uh, created, I don't know, we'll see, maybe it'll have a little bit of different language, but I'll tell you what I, um, how I articulate uh, SDG zero, which is indigenous sovereignty, worldview, wisdom, and voice. And um, so for me um, personally, indigenous air just brings an indigenous lens um, into modern technologies and um, cares about indigenous land story sovereignty and stewardship this is the whole we're talking about sustainable development goals um, and sustainability is just uh, a, a part of it so naturally um, we're having an impact on on no hunger naturally on good health and well-being naturally on gender equity decent work economic growth reduced inequalities all of those things and um, so we are um, 
about to launch a hashtag and a movement, hashtag SDG zero, um, and a movement to work together to embrace and integrate SDG uh, goal zero as a sacred circle around all the other SDGs. That's why we chose the zero to represent the uh, circle and all uh, encompassing. And so, I mean, there's just a couple of us in off in the corner working on this, but I just have a sneaking suspicion that this is actually going to be a something. And um, I can't even say 17 anymore. It's hilarious. I was on one of these calls the other day and they were talking about 17 uh, STGs. And I was like, they better do their homework. There's 18 STGs, SDGs. They're not 17 because it's already <laughs> so in my mind that there are 18 SDGs um, and uh, at, with SDG zero, uh, Indigenous sovereignty, worldview, wisdom, and voice as the sacred circle around all SDGs. Mm, I love it. I love it. I love it that it's the sacred circle around it. Like, what a beautiful way to actually encompass um, that. And lots of people saying, I can feel the energy. And there's not just a few of you, because you know that within the CEO network, um, you know, when this goes, we're all going to be supporting it and we will make that hashtag go viral. I am it's pretty going. sure of it. It's, it's going. It's going to happen. We're just we going to wait it. and we're just going to wait until uh, these ventures application closes or else yep. people will be like, I want to do SDG zero and it's not on the application. Um, so in yeah, the we're, we're already discussing how we update that on the back end. Don't worry. <laughs> for the next round for the next round and and so yeah thank you for that tira and and leading that and there's so many people i know that are involved and i love beach another ceo venture um and so on so this is a beautiful piece what i want to do is just do a quick breakout um we've put some people there's some people that uh, have had to leave early so we've just added some people maybe into your room please do a quick intro but please wrap up like whatever learnings or one thing that you are going to implement maybe into your own business or look into um or maybe there is a tip or tool we didn't mention here and you want to share within your group um, and then come back and make sure to put those tips into the chat. You can save the chat with the three little dots off to the side. So please share your LinkedIn with each other, connect with each other of how we can support. When we come back, we'll have a couple more uh, tips and then, um, and then we'll be wrapped up. So if you can go off for about seven minutes, I'm going to recreate those rooms and here we go. Welcome back, everybody. You're slowly popping back in. Everyone pretty much almost waited to the last minute, which means you wanted more time. I know it. It's going to be in the feedback form. That's totally okay. Um, <laughs> we're always, I, I swear we could do a, the uh, CEO sessions for way longer. There is a feedback form I just put in the chat. Please fill it out. I will send up a wrap up email with that. We live off feedback. Literally the feedback forms goes into the CEO Slack channel instantaneously. And we do weekly meetings and we're always commenting and, and iterating. So feedback means a lot for us. And um, I want to hear what is there any tips or something you're going to take away uh, you can take yourself off mute and share for a few seconds and uh, please or you can put it in chat does anyone want to share like a takeaway um, anything like that yes megan i agree many tools are so suggested um, they're really, really valuable. I don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed. We wanted to show a couple different models. That does not mean you should be doing everything. Um, all of us built this in as we went, as it worked for our model. Um, and, and so you can start where you're at. Um, even just simply the B Corp in assessment tool gives you a really good indicator of what you can be putting into your, you need human resources policies, you know, all of those types of things, you'll need that in your organization and do B Corp, and it gives you a, a piece that you can put on there. Um, yes, Dana, the tools will hopefully give me a bit more focus on how to become more socially responsible with my profession, for sure. Um, 
anything else as we do these pieces? I want to make sure you can just come off mute. Uh, Diane, we all agreed that we want to include SDGs from the get-go so that it is not possible to push them aside as we go or when, or when we're rushing. Let me tell you what happened during COVID with all the big, we talk about, you know, we went from a movement of having corporate and social responsibility. You would hear that a lot, right? CSR. Then we started hearing about social enterprises and social impact. And it, it's kind of like we're moving in and closer, getting, getting closer to the core of being more regenerative instead of extractive in our work. Um, but what happens when you have a CSR model is that when something like COVID or any type of downturn happens, CSR is the first thing to go. They're not donating to local things. They're not doing uh, things for employees. The training goes, maybe they don't, they start laying people off. And so how do you do this that it's not an add on in your model. It's in the core of your model of who you are, what you're doing and, and living and breathing. And that when customers think of you, they think of what you're doing and the impact you're having on the world. And that's the story they're telling about you because you're having that incredible impact. Julia, did you have anything to add? Cause I noticed you're off mute. Maybe not. <laughs> hey, that's a I think joke. seriously, I'm sorry. I'm like, <laughs> I'm continuing conversations. I'm going to put myself on mute. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I'm just paying attention, making sure we can see that those. Mutes. Can I say something? Yeah, absolutely, Mary, please. So uh, my name is Mary. I'm with Reese Community, started Reese Community, um, and we do uh, online reporting for sexual violence on campus. And, and I think it was just so interesting tonight, flipping or thinking about flipping, recognizing that tomorrow's Giving Tuesday. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I would be inclined to talk about how others can give and how they can support you know, support survivors and make change and those kinds of things, instead of looking and kind of amplifying what we are, how we are giving and what we are giving. And I think when Suzanne said, you know, they don't like to kind of toot their own horn, it's easy just to just quietly go about your work. And, and it's good to think about really the, and, and shout about the, the ways that you're making change. Um, cause you, you know, we know it within our, within our companies, within our businesses, but to be a little bolder about that is a real big takeaway that I took tonight. So just want to say thank you for that. Mm, I love that. Yeah. That reverse piece of that, of what you're doing and how you're giving. And it is tomorrow is giving Tuesday. Um, giving Tuesday is the, someone asked what it is. It's actually the response to black Friday and cyber Monday, which I feel like black Friday was cyber Monday anyway, uh, COVID and everything else. But, um, it's the response of kind of the consumerism and then an organization started giving Tuesday because we spend all these days kind of buying in consumer and we should now turn around and give lots of people do it in lots of different ways. You'll look at the hashtag giving Tuesday, please check it out. Uh, there uh, is a question around wondering an example of SGG 717. That's the partnership one. I encourage you when you go on to the United Nations Sustainable Goals, you can dive into them and there's more like there's 17.1 and 0.2 and 0.3 of all of them. And that's what our ventures do. They're actually reporting in on the point something. So it gets very specific. It's not just gender equality. It's no violence against women, whatever that is, 7.7. .7, and they're reporting in right on that one. So I encourage you to go in. The partnership one, I'll tell you, we don't see a lot of because there's not, you could use partnership for so many different things. It could be in partnership with a nonprofit. It could be a, a supply chain. It could be whatever. So dive into the very, like the point twos or whatever to figure out what that is for you. We don't see a lot of partnership. We see a more, way more on the environments, ethical supply chain. And again, this was written for government. So you get to take your business lens and go in to see um, what is going to be more useful for you. So let's all give a little bit of a round of applause for Suzanne and Florence for stepping in, giving up their time. Um, I love the CEO Ventures, always giving up all their time to share with everyone else. And 
I would be, you know, I think that CEO, if you're not a part of the community, become an activator. The only real difference between ventures and activators now are ventures re receive the 0% loan, but this community is here to support each other and grow each other. If you have a business and you want to become an activator, it's $92 a month um, in your country region. In the UK, it's 72. You're investing in women led ventures and that money goes into a perpetual fund and funds forever but you're also investing in yourself. You're showing up on these learning circles, on these calls, you're, you're doing the work. And so this investment is really in yourself and in other women. And I'm a venture, you can never get rid of me. And I still became an activator because I saw what this network did for my venture. And I wanted my money and my three daughters to be able to know that there's something here to fund them for generations to come because only 2.2% of the venture capital funding goes to women and 0.0006% to black women. And our indigenous women are not even being tracked. And that is not a world that any of us want to live in. And so um, thank you for showing up, being on this call. We'll send everything out afterwards. And um, we can't wait till the next learning circle. It's gonna be your powerful ask and we're probably gonna have another secret of one coming out around economy. Um, and a great author. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a great time. My little baby pug has now torn up my whole office. So this is the time to say goodbye. Have a great night or morning, no matter where you are in the world. Thank you.